Okay, so today we're going to be talking about creating your own data types. Now, in C++, there are two ways you can do this. And in most other programming languages, there's generally one way to do this. And it's commonly the more accepted way. But I'm going to show you both ways in C++ because they're both useful and they both have merit. Now, the first way is a throwback or a hold on from C and it's called a struct and the way you create a struct is like so now when you create a struct you have to put there you format it like this type def struct again not going to explain this just to mean this is just an introductory programming thing not an in-depth lesson on C or C++ so just kind of trust it and use it as you see it. Now, you put the two curly brackets and then you put the name of the struct. I'm calling this ball and then a semicolon. Now what you can do with this is you can, in between the curly brackets, put all the data types you want in that you want. So since this is a ball, I can say create uh, floating points which represent its x and y coordinates and then I can create integers which represent its velocity in both x and y and what this lets me do is just by referencing this type ball I can access these variables and I can treat ball as a normal type of variable and do with it all the things that you've seen in earlier videos so it's really just a way of simplifying things and bringing and condensing things down into just one variable type you don't have to create a whole set of variables for x, y, velocity, x, and y for every ball you create or every type you create. You can just create a variable. Now, these variables are created within the scope of this struct, so I can't access them from outside that. So in order for me to talk to them or to access them, to read and write from them, I'm going to create a variable ball, call it b, and then I'm going to say b dot x and then I can set it so I access the variables in it by putting a dot in it that means it's a reference to these variables so I can set them I can read from them you shouldn't initialize them in the struct you should just let them be as they are leave them uninitialized and then initialize them when you in, uh, create the variable so I can set all these variables independently, b dot y equals 20, uh, b dot vel x equals negative 1, b dot vel y equals 1. And I can treat this, again, just like any other variable. I can say create an array of balls, and I'll call them balls, and I will make 10 of them. And then I can say for int i equals 0, i is less than 10, i plus plus. I can say balls uh, i equal or ball no balls i dot x equals i balls i dot y equals i divided by two. So I again I can interact with it like I would any other variable type, but I have all of these other things that I can access in it. So Again, it's a way of just sort of condensing them all down to make something that's easier and cleaner. Now, this is the very simple way to do it. There's not a lot you can do with it other than what I've just showed you. For example, there's no way to say which variables you can and can't access. You can't put functions into this without a certain level of work. So in C++, and like most other languages, they became known as object-oriented languages because they added something called objects and classes and this is the other way to create your own custom data types you're creating these things called classes and there's they're an improvement on structs so I'm going to show you how to set those up so I'm gonna start by creating two files uh, I'm going to create I'm going to use the exact same thing ball dot uh, cpp and yeah, I want to add that. And I'm going to create 
ball.h. Let's say VS, I want to add that. And I'm just going to uh, comment out this struct real quick, just so that it doesn't interfere with the code I'm about to write. Uh, there we go. And I'll comment. Uh, this is from the struct. Okay. So, in this, I'm going to... The way you create a class is by saying class, or public, uh, zoom in. Come on. Keep moving my mouse. Public, class, ball. And yes, I'm putting this in the ball.h file. That is how you create the class, and it gives it the name ball, and by saying public, it means that anyone can access it. So this gives you a certain amount of protection for different variables. So you can, anything within these two curly brackets is defined as part of the ball class. So I can create a public section, and then a private section. So anything in the public section can be accessed by any external function and by any external code, whereas things in private can only be accessed and modified by things within the ball class itself. So you can create variables which are very sensitive and are only updated by certain things within the class itself and can't be touched by other bits of code, lest you, you know, screw it up or make changes that you didn't want to make in the first place. So I can do the exact same thing. I can create the variables float x and y, int vel x and vel y. And I can put things in private, like, say, uh, the color, int um, R I can create RGB. Those are just variables. It doesn't actually do that. Just to be clear, these are just variables. And if I go back to main.cpp and I include these, or include ball.h. Build it. Uh, expected qualifier before public. Oh, okay. It's not called public class. That is... Yeah, okay. It's not called public class. It's just class. But the public and private regions still stay the same. Okay. So what I can do in the main is... I can say ball b, and I can say b dot x equals 10, and I'm allowed to access that. But if I try and say b dot r equals 255, you can see error, r is private. So it's protecting me from doing something that I shouldn't be doing. And it will actually throw a compilation error instead of just ignoring it altogether and doing something you shouldn't be doing. So that's the advantage to public and private. Now, the other thing you can do in classes, which is an improvement over structs, is you can define functions specific for each class. So I can create a function called balance. And I can create that within the ball.h's public section so that I can call it publicly. It can be used by any other code. In order to define that function, I have to go into ball.cpp and I say include, let me zoom in, include ball.h. Now remember last video I talked about the namespace, the whole standard thing? In this way, it's very similar, but it's a little different. In order for me to define a function as part of, or in order for the compiler to know that this function is being defined as part of the ball class, I have to say ball, and then two colons, and then the name of the function, bounce. And this should be defined as void. And there we go. So now you have a function called bounce and it's part of the ball function. So I can say, if I include in here, iStream using namespace standard, I can say cout 
bounce. So I create this function called bounce. And this is only this is accessible to the this is a ball function and it's accessible to any other code because it's defined as public. I can also define private functions. Uh, void update coordinates. Any of the variables that are defined within the class ball are accessible to these functions. Again, the variables themselves are not accessible or are accessible to external code depending on whether def they're defined as public or private. Now declaring the private function void ball update coordinates I spelled that right is exactly the same. So in order for me to access those variables I can just say x plus equals 10 or y plus equals 10. And because it's part of the ball class, it knows exactly which ball you're talking about, which variable you're talking about, and updates the proper ones accordingly. So you can access individual variables, public or private, without having to say ball dot or variable dot x, y, whatever. So this is uh, missing a colon. There we go. So this is a step up from the st, uh, the c standby of type def structs. So I can say b dot bounce and if I run that see it outputs bounce but if I try to run b dot update coordinates I spell that right again you can see that it again complains that because it's private I can't access it so it's the public and private protection applies not only to variables, but also to function definitions. So if I get rid of the update coordinate function, and I go back to ball.cpp, and in the bounce function I call update, update coord, I can access it from within this function and then when I call b dot bounce I you can see that I set b to b or b dot x to be 10 and so if I output b dot x you should see that it gets updated when I run bounce you can see that it is now 20 and that is really the basics for using and creating your own custom data types. Whether you're going to be using a type def struct or a class really depends on what you're looking to do. However, classes are generally better because they include far more and the whole public private protection thing, being able to define your own functions which are accessible to the functions them, or to the classes themselves, make them a step above just normal type def structs. Now, common errors when it comes to doing this sort of when creating classes and structs. Obviously if you forget the semicolon at the end of the class definition you're gonna get an error because it should be expecting a semicolon at the end of the class definition. Uh, if you forget to put the double colon here you can see that it no longer knows what the variables x or y are because it doesn't know what class or any class or any scope that you're talking about. So you have to make sure you know what the compiler knows which namespace you're in by saying ball double colon or whatever your variable is called. Uh, when creating type def structs, if I uncomment this and just delete this real quick, or just comment that real quick. If I don't put type def in the front and I try and compile it, by not putting the type def struct or the type def before struct, it's not really necessary. That's an old hold from C, but it does make it more clear to the reader or to you later on that this is a type definition. Again, assume that it's magic for now because this isn't a lesson on C and C++. 
put the type def if you want, don't put the type def if you don't, it really doesn't affect the functionality of the code either way. So that's really it for the common errors that you could run into in creating your own types. Uh, try this code out yourself, run through a couple of the examples, and um, modify the code. See what works, see what doesn't, as you should when watching these. Uh, look at the exercise at the end of this video. Try it. The answer will be in the next video, and I will see you all there.